martello, which is a hammer. Uh, that's how a lot of his players describe him. That's how a lot of people describe him. He's he's relentless and he, he pounds on you as, if you're in his team. He, he really just continues to hit you with the same messages again and again and again. And he works you and he works you and he works you and he's relentless. Doesn't matter who you are, what the name on the back of your shirt is, he doesn't care, he'll drop you. It's that, it's that simple with Conte. The idea that Conte is someone who is just absolutely unyielding like a hammer is, is someone who is hard, someone who is just designed to do one thing. And he is designed as a manager to win football games. It was only recently that Antonio Conte entered the scrutiny of the Premier League. So why would a man who was born and raised in Italy want to test himself on the King's Road? Yeah, he's always someone who's been quite blue collar. He's always had to earn his place in the game. A player who started off playing at his uh, local amateur club, which run by his father, was uh, Juventus affiliated, but in Lecce. They wore Juventus' colours even though they weren't in Lecce. He made his professional debut, I think, at 16. He was always talked about the idea that he doesn't think he was um, predestinato as a player. He doesn't think that he was someone who was destined to be a great success. Um, he thinks that's something that some other players had, and he was just okay. He was just an average kind of guy who had to work really hard to, to be a success. Conte, though, recognised that he was not as good as the players around him, particularly Juventus. That midfield, which had Zinedine Zidane on one side, Edgar Davids on the, on the other, if you haven't got the skills that others have, you have to compensate for it somehow. And he compensated by that, covering every blade of grass possible. And that was why he became a captain. He was the man, the warrior in midfield at Juventus. The guy that Trapattoni and then uh, Marcello Lippi relied upon. He had that strength and that courage and that vision to know what he was doing wrong and how to improve it and how to really just get the rest of the team playing to their levels. And he won five league titles there. He won a Champions League there. He won the UEFA Cup there. He went to more Champions League finals there. He was the captain. Um, I think the idea that Conte wasn't something special as a player is something that maybe he truly believes in his head and maybe that is what drove him to be someone who was so implacable, someone who was so desperate to work harder and do better, is that he genuinely didn't buy into this thought that he was a special player. He uh, finished as a player and uh, he went into management. Uh, he started off with Arezzo in Serie B. And that is seen as something that is quite natural in Italy. They talk about fare la gavetta, which is to come up through the ranks. So not be an entitled ex-player and expect your first job to be in, in Serie A, but to work really from the bottom up. And he was humble enough to do that. And I think that's another thing that it's big about Conte. Conte's big on himself, his humility. And moved on to Bari, who he got promoted to Serie A and then walked away from. And I think this is one of those moments which gives you an insight to his character. He didn't go with Bari to Serie A because they wouldn't sign him the players that he thought he needed to be in Serie A. He wanted to be able to play a 4-2-4, this bold attacking formation. And the board didn't support it, so he said, all right, you know, I've just worked my way up here and I'll leave rather than go up here and do this in a way that I don't believe in. Why the 4-2-4 worked in Italy? The tactical trend in Italy in the late 2000s was to play a narrow 4-3-1-2, following the success of AC Milan in the Champions League and later Inter Milan under Jose Mourinho. A lot of Serie A and Serie B teams adopted this formation. Conte went the other way. He set up his team with a 4-2-4 at Bari and Siena with great success. This formation created a natural overload on the opposition's fullback, with either on the right-hand side the right-back and the right-winger overloading the opposition left-back or consequently on the other side the same situation. Conte dominated both Serie B and Serie A with this formation. From there it was on to Atalanta briefly. Uh, that was the one job in his managerial career that you could say probably didn't really work out. Um, he was only there for 13 games. Um, then on to Siena for a couple of seasons. Success there. But then back in top division. And then Juventus. But the thing is for Conte, he was adamant that he had to get the job on merit as a coach alone. He knew he had good standing at Juventus from his time there as a player. He'd achieved a lot. But it was key for him that he was viewed solely through the prism of a manager. And he talks about it beautifully. He says, you know, my four and a half year journey back to Turin, it was a long one, but it's been the most beautiful one. And yet, I think there's so much more than passion to him. When he interviewed for the job, he, he told the president very bluntly, look, I don't think this team is playing to the level it should be. I don't think it's an elite level club. And the president, understandably, you know, quite impressed with, with his gumption, asked him what he would change. And Conte spent the next three hours outlining what he would do. We all now take Juventus' success for granted, that Juventus are a super club again. Yeah, you know, they were down on their luck. By historical standards, um, they were going through a torrid time. You know, back to back seven place finishes. They really didn't look like coming back at all. Um, I remember when he got the job, 
the press were talking about, or oh, maybe they'll get back into Europe, into the Champions League. Conte never interested in that, only interested in winning. Credo che Antonio Conte come allenatore abbia cambiato da subito il rapporto tra giocatori e, e lui stesso. Infatti questo ha permesso al gruppo di, di lavorare nel massimo rispetto totale e credo che anche mh, con i tifosi sia riuscito a, a cambiare questo, questo atteggiamento e creare subito un gruppo unito proteso verso la vittoria. He took them to the gym and he spoke to those players and he said to them, this is Juventus, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You've got to eat grass, you've got to start from the bottom and you've got to realize that you're nothing at the moment. I don't care where you're playing, I don't care what badge you've got on, on your jersey. You are really at the bottom of the pile right now and you need to build yourself back up. And they did and they went a year not even losing a single game in Serie A, which was a magnificent achievement and all done in their first season under Antonio Conte. So what he did was really something quite special, established an identity, a wonderful uh, tactical strategy that he had to uh, change and, and adapt to because he had Andrea Pirlo and obviously then they kept winning. Third season goes past 100 points. No one had done that in, in history in Italy. And he probably didn't get the credit he deserved outside of Italy for that, maybe because he didn't have the same success in Europe. In the way he talks about being a manager, you perceive a certain reverence for the role. Um, I think the fact that he will talk about this idea that when he was a player, he was not in predestinato. He was not someone who was destined to be brilliant. But as a manager, he thinks he was. I think that's something that you almost couldn't imagine hearing out of the, the, the lips of a manager from many other countries because the idea that, you know, that exceptional born-to-be managers exist is not something that maybe even is thought about in other countries. But for Conte, that's something that, that was deeply embedded within him. When he started managing, he was like, no, this is, this is what I was meant to do. So why the three at the back at Juventus? Following Conte's success with a 4-2-4, he moved to Juventus in 2011 and came up with a real problem. He had three world-class central midfielders that he had to get in his team, Pirlo, Vidal and of course Marchisio. So in fact he moved to a 3-5-2, which got the best out of Barzagli, Bonucci, Chiellini and also allowed Pirlo to be in defensive midfield and dictate the play in front of the back three. Conte has always thought of himself, and a lot of Italian managers think of themselves as tailors. They cut their cloth accordingly, they make something bespoke for the team that they have. Even if there are players that are more talented than some of the ones he selects, his key selection criteria is what kind of man you are, what kind of character you are, whether, whether you, know, you could be in the trenches together, look at, uh, to either side of you and basically trust the guy that he'll have your back. That is key to Conte's coaching philosophy. All Italians are like, to create a siege mentality. You know, before big finals, just before games on the weekend, they all leave home and go and stay in a hotel for the night and just prepare. Yeah, the next day, it's battle and that's it. Yeah, I think Conte really drives that home. Um, he is condottiero, as they say in Italian. He's a, yeah, he's a big commander. He likes being that leader, he likes being the general. I think that's what he's always been a leader of men. I think he's fiercely loyal to the players that he trusts and he manages to get things out of those players that maybe not everyone else can get. And I think you look at the, the Euros and maybe it's someone like Jack Guerini playing for Italy at the Euros at a time when he, his career wasn't going great. He'd been in England and he hadn't been a success. And people are looking and going, really? You, you want him along for the ride? And look, when you have that relationship, that individual relationship with a player where you know that they're going to do everything for you and you'll do everything for them, I think that can carry a certain extra value. And I think that's something that you could point to all through Conte's career. I think he had players like that at uh, Juventus, uh, Simone Pepe for instance, and I think he's doing that already at Chelsea with some players as well. You see that once he believes in you, it's very hard for him to lose that belief in you. And I think that that becomes a mutual bond and becomes something that really helps his teams to thrive. While that Juventus team is now kind of moving away subtly from Conte, it's still got that mentality drilled into them that he put in. And I think, again, that's something that's so important, something that he shares, I think, with Mourinho that ability to just instill a winning mentality instantly on players and turn losers into winners like that. Conte certainly devotes so much of his life to football that it's not easy to sort of see the person apart from the football context. He's talked about uh, before the idea that he uh, only sleeps about five hours a night and he sort of that leaves him three hours to spend with his family which you know I guess would be what a normal person would spend sleeping there for eight hours so five hours for sleep three hours for family and the rest is football that's how he that's how he views life. Conte's wife Elisabetta will tell this story about how you know she'll be in bed and it'll be the early hours of the morning and she'll realize that Antonio's not there anymore 
and um, she'll get up and go and try and find him. She'll go downstairs and no lights on. The only light is the computer screen or the TV screen and he's there studying you know, the opponent, studying a training session that's just happened, studying his team's performance from the last game. The Italy job when he had that for, for two years, he talked a lot about how frustrating he found it, about how he felt like uh, he was spending all of his time like someone who had a fancy car in his garage but wasn't able to drive it because he couldn't actually do day-to-day -day football. That's what he was stuck doing, was, was waiting. A lot of people didn't think that he was going to be very good, largely also because of the fact that the squad was rather poor. He didn't have the great talents that we had and, and all those good, good players were now reaching, you know, they were too old basically, they couldn't really play anymore. I think in terms of managers that Conte has worked under, Marcello Lippi, Juventus is the one who obviously had a big influence on his, on his playing career. I'm sure he took something from him. But I think you would also probably say that Conte has taken something from his time at the manager's school in Coverciano and working under someone like Renzo Oliveri, who is the, the head of that. The spirit that they have there at the manager's school, um, they talk a lot about this idea recently in particular of moving towards something that goes beyond one rigid tactical system and the idea of fluid systems that flow one into the other. And when you look at what Conte did at the Euros in particular, I think that's something that really speaks to that idea. Like it was very much a, a formation that would start off looking like it was one thing that might be a, a 3-5-2 and then during the game you'd realize that in possession and out of possession it was two, two different formations. It was a formation that adjusted to a four-man defense when you had the ball and was a three-man defense when you didn't. Yeah, most of them thought they'd be knocked out at the group stage or at least in the first hurdle but they weren't. They were magnificent and after that he got rave reviews and he was really looked upon as someone special which is interesting considering everything he had done with Juventus up until that point. Bespoke game plans for every opponent. It's not like for example if we play our way then we will win. Conte is very much aware of, of, of covering his own weaknesses, but also finding the others and not letting the opponents play to their strengths. And I think that is, you know, the players, when they have that kind of information, that kind of intel going into games, it serves them so well and means they play with such confidence. He has always been quite a bold manager. He's always been a manager who's quite interested in, in specifically the role of the manager. I think you look back at his uh, first uh, foray into uh, um, sports um, study and he, did, he wrote a thesis at university on, on the personality of a manager. I think that side of things has always fascinated him. The idea of what it takes mentally to do to lead a team, what it takes to inspire a group of players. I think that's something that's something that really speaks to who he is and who he wants to be. When a new manager, uh, a new coach, arrives in, in a new team, uh, I, I think it's very important to uh, to start to study the situation, above all your players, uh, to understand the right characteristic, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of things about uh, about them, and then uh, uh, together to to try to for me to to bring my idea of football, my my philosophy. Uh, yeah, also new new methodology to, to, to training, uh, the analysis video. People were really excited about Conte's arrival. Our first game under him was against West Ham at home and we managed to deck out our entire Matthew Harding stand into an Italian flag. From the first uh, game against West Ham, uh, they showed me uh, a fantastic support uh, with the flag. Italian flag in the stand. But he has you know, gone far beyond the levels of expectation. As a coach, I think it's very, very difficult to, to sometimes give your ideas and for the players, in this case, to, to understand what you want. That's the most difficult, I think, especially when you go to a new club with new things for him, a new culture, new understanding of football. And I think he did it very quickly. I think everyone at the beginning, when we saw the, the methods that he worked on and stuff, we thought, well, you know, it's very hard. Uh, and we felt that sometimes he was a little bit too demanding, we thought, at the time. He was going to make sure that the players were pulling in the same direction, make sure that the club was as one, from fan to player and, you know, everybody in between. And I think he's done that superbly. A coach that is very intelligent, very demanding, smart, and uh, most important, he knows what he's doing and uh, he's a still a young coach, so that says a lot about him. Oh, you, you watch Conte on the line as much as you watch a man with the ball at his feet. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's, it's uh, like mesmerising, it's captivating. It's honestly, I've never seen anybody on, on a touchline, ever, ever at Chelsea, and I follow England as well, never with England. 
who who represents me more. So what would a man who's very well known for his tactics have to learn in the Premier League? Uh, we are learning a new method of, of, of working, in, in, in training especially, uh, and when we are with him uh, in terms of tactics, because I think he has like three or four guys very, very good on the physical aspect that we are working. I think if you have interviewed all of the players, everyone will tell you that we've never worked as hard in, a, in our career. And uh, I think that's fair to say that uh, it has helped us a lot to be in good shape. I think it paid off because he put really one into shape very fast. Uh, we train uh, every single day tactics, which we didn't do as much maybe. Maybe with Jose a little bit more in, in the first year. But every day repeating, repeating what he wants. And I think uh, it's a big um, compliment for him, you know, and uh, to, to, to be able to achieve this so fast, especially after when we started with uh, one system and then straight away when he thought or when we saw that uh, things weren't working as he wanted, he completely changed straight away and to be able to, to make the players understand so fast what he wanted in another system. But what is it about Conte's methods which leave him open to criticism? When he believes something is right in absolute terms, he's not going to turn from that. Um, I think that it's the flip side of all the positives you could say about his loyalty to players is that maybe he would close himself off to uh, different players. I think certainly with Italy you could say there were some players who didn't get as good of a chance under Conte as maybe their talent and their performance deserved because he already had guys who he trusted. He wins the trophy and he'll do it if he has to step on your back to get there. He genuinely cannot bear the thought of coming second or losing. And if that means that he's branded as disloyal, if he's branded as arrogant, he doesn't care. And to be fair, as much as Juve is about stealing Juve, there's one thing that's a very famous quote, which is winning is the only thing that matters. So he really took that to heart. <laughs> And I think the other kind of inflexibility would be, uh, you know, just in the greater way that he conceives uh, what can be achieved. He was the one that turned around and left Juventus and said, I can't really do much with a team that costs £10 in, in a Champions League that requires, you know, £100 players, basically. And he said, well, if you, you, know, you want to play the best, then you have to be the best. Well, you know what? They reached the final and they did it without you. So that's kind of a little bit of a sour note for us. His successor, Max Allegri, applies a much more patient approach. You'll often hear him, instead of haranguing his players from the sideline like Conte does, he's there just going, patience, patience. You know, the, the chance will come. It's definitely a double-edged sword because I think that absolute conviction is something that you see in all the best football managers at a certain point. There's something missing with Conte and we don't know what it is. We don't know whether it's because he's so trigger-happy trigger with... with comments in his post-match comments that are just sometimes a little bit embarrassing. He sometimes gets too angry, says things that he shouldn't. He re you really sometimes need to mute him or muzzle him because he can get carried away. He is such a winner and he sometimes says things that you just wish he never said. But if we can just change that aspect about him, which of course at the moment Chelsea haven't really seen. We've seen a completely different Conte in, in England. I think, if anything, he's wanted to move away from that Mourinho image. Uh, he's been quite clever because I think when he got to Chelsea, he made a kind of analysis of what had gone wrong the season before and perhaps some of those mind games hadn't worked for Mourinho, in fact, had worked against him. And so we've seen a very convivial, very smiley Conte, which I think if you speak to any Italian observer, people in the press corps that followed him at Juventus and uh, with Italy, um, it's not a Conte they recognise. It's that kind of, that desperation within where he talks about football 24-7. He just annoys everyone with, do you think I should have done this? And, sh and shall I play this type of formation? And, and he is a genuine winner. He cannot handle it if he is not considered the best. He, he has to be the man who revolutionised football. He has to be the man who overcomes all obstacles, technical limitations, and, and be the best because he always wants to be the best. And, and I think the, the great story is that sometimes that means, you know, overcoming loyalties. He's not exactly the most loyal. A manager comes in, bang, he hits ground running, you win a double in the first year, you win the league the second year, you might have a dodgy third year, he gets sacked, you do it again. That is something I really don't want to happen here. 
it's something that could happen. Of course, this is the beginning for Conte, who's only just starting to build at Chelsea. Well, Andrea Pirlo, for example, will say he's the best manager he's ever played for. And this was, um, yeah, coming to the last few years of, of Pirlo's career. Yeah, he's played under great managers before, Ancelotti, Lippi, um, to name but a few. I think what stood out for him was the detail that Conte goes into. He's obsessive about video um, review, film study. I think he does that to a degree that is, you know, would be considered mad by, by some managers. I think he, the, the, the length of video sessions that he has with his players has been talked about more than an hour at a time, which is a lot longer than other, a lot of other clubs would do. The, the best way it is, it's, it's Pelo's words, whether they were written by him or a ghostwriter, they do kind of crash through your mind. It's, it's, I mean, it's him jumping around on the sidelines. It's the fact that really, he's still kicking the ball in his mind. He might not be a player anymore, but he is still living every action. How we are uh, as a players in terms of how you have to treat them, what they're thinking. Obviously, every person, every player is, is, is different, but he knows more or less how, which way to go, you know, in certain some players they need more of the talking, more to be more behind them all the time to, to, to make them work. Some others, you know, that they will do them the, the right thing or try to do the right thing anyway. He remembers, you know, when the ball came to him, yeah, you know, if he didn't know what to do with it straight away, the crowd would soon be on his back whistling him. He never wants his players to be in that kind of position. So he gives them, you know, obviously a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. With all those solutions, they know what to do. They're unfazed by anything and they can play with confidence and, uh, and, and, and perform like perhaps they don't in, in other contexts, in, with other clubs and other managers. And that, again, just goes back to what Conte was as, like as a player. He never wants players to be in the position that he was in. Uh, my experience uh, as, a, as a former player is very important because uh, uh, I think to know what in this moment uh, uh, my player is thinking. Talent, good technique, and also uh, to be uh, fast, uh, strong, and with a good stamina. I think these uh, five characteristics is very important to play in uh, in uh, in top in top team. Since day one, we saw someone that uh, we respect. He's been very straightforward with everyone. You don't work, you don't play. You don't do what he says or what he wants, you don't play. And uh, I think that made everyone, you know, really focused from the beginning. And you can see that the team is, is playing very well. So where next? It's the Champions League. Can this system that Chelsea and Conte have put together work against the big boys with better midfielders and better quality chance creation in that final third? The 3-4-3 will really be tested. The defensive move back to a 5-4-1 that's been so successful for Chelsea in the Premier League will be tried and tested by Europe's elite, the likes of Luka Modric, Tony Cruz, and of course Andres Iniesta trying to unlock that deep defence. Being in Stamford Bridge at the moment is the best feeling in the world. It really is. It's the happiest place the squad are together. That uh, reverberates around the stadium. Honestly, the song that is sung more than any and more, with more volume than any is a song for Antonio Conte. It's a spin on a dance classic. Ain't nobody. And uh, I hope uh, until the end uh, to continue this, uh, this support for me and for my player because uh, I think uh, our fans are the 12 players for me in the pitch. We're going into games now thinking we're going to win. He's instilled that belief in both the support and the players that Chelsea are going to win the game. Not winning isn't an option. It may happen, but that's certainly not a possibility before the game. Stamford Bridge is a fortress again. It's a happy place again. It's a loud place again. And it all stems from Antonio Conte. Ch Chelsea now, we go away from home and we expect to win the game. I always remember it struck me when he said, it's never enough to be good at just one thing. You, know, you can't just be good at tactics, you can't just be good at media, you can't just be good you know, when it comes to, I don't know, recruiting, and all that sort of thing. You have to be global, you have to have everything, you have to be the total manager. And um, yeah, I think that's something, again, which is, is, is why he's the manager, he's a complete manager. And it's such a good feeling, it's such a good feeling. Everything that he wants is what we want, everything that he demands is what we demand, and it isn't success. This is the, this is the difference. Certain certain support bases 
They have a right to demand success. The obvious clubs. Chelsea fans of my generation and above wouldn't demand success. They would demand attitude, effort, heart, fight, spite, maybe, probably. Conte demands all those things and long may it continue.